Annabelle Gaberti. You may know me as the founding and managing partner of London and Paris law firm Crefovi. Crefovi is the best law firm to support the creative industries in navigating complex business issues wherever they are in the world. In this new iteration of Crefovi, which is 10 years old this month, we have launched annual and monthly subscription plans that allow you to stay up to date with relevant legal news and updates focusing on the creative industries. Via our weekly newsletter, our weekly thought leadership articles and our lawfully creative podcasts, you are empowered to lay out your strategy for your creative project which is compliant with the latest legal and business updates. Subscribe today on crefovi.com slash store for the English version or crefovi.com slash magasin for the French version. This is Annabelle Gaberti and you're listening to Lawfully Creative from Crefovi. It takes real musical chops to collaborate with Nelly Furtado and David Usher, touring with them and being parts of a live band for several months. My guest today, singer, songwriter, composer and more recently finance student Kim Bingham, is an accomplished musician who strives to always improve herself and develop her full potential. Recipient of the Prix Gémeaux for Best Theme Song with The Hero's Take and winner of the Best Short Form Video Award at the 2013 Independent Music Awards with Up, Kim is making a mark in the music industry. As a music performer, Kim is best known for singles such as Up, Bel Ami and Bepe Green. She's also brought her talent behind the scene, composing the soundtrack for the series Les Invincibles, both the Canadian version and European version. I wanted to know how she got her start in performing. You were born in Montréal? Is, is that I am. Yes, yeah? I was, yes. Later. So when you, were, when you were a kid, were you speaking French or English or Québécois? Or? I was speaking three languages as a kid. I was speaking uh, French at school because it was uh, kindergarten from, from kindergarten up to the end of high school. I was in uh, French school. And so since I could pretty much since I could speak, I've been speaking French. And then at home, it was English and Ukrainian. Um, as I'm, yeah, my, Indeed, I saw on your uh, Instagram and, um, and Facebook, but is that your great grandmother or your grandmother? It was my great grandmother in that photo. Right. Yes. Yeah. You, yeah. You knew your great grandmother. I mean, I, I personally briefly knew my great grandmother, but I've been a belly even like, so did you have a relationship with her somehow? Or? Yeah, she, uh, she, sh uh, her, she and my great grandfather partially raised me and my sister while my parents were, you know, working, they'd be the ones picking us up after school and taking care of us until my parents were finished work. So, uh, we naturally, my sister and I became fluent in Ukrainian Mm -hmm. And uh, I spoke Ukrainian with her up until, I mean, you know, she, she died when I was 28 years old. And since then I've lost the language. But yeah, um, it, that, so those are the three languages that but I've spoken. Now I know where those beautiful blue eyes come from. <laughs> yeah. so, so that's your great grandmother, not your grandmother. That's my great grandmother. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so she she was Ukrainian as well as your great grandfather. Wow. She's yes, yes, yeah. Ukrainian to be, be even more specific. Uh, Ukrainian and um, my that those the Ukrainian part part of the family, and then my mom was also born in Poland, so I'm also part Polish as well. But I didn't don't speak Polish as well as I used to speak Ukrainian. Anyway, it's a big it's a bit of a mix. Ukrainian sign is on your dad's side, and then your mom's side. She's got some Polish Polish blood no uh my, my dad's jamaican my mom is polish and ukrainian my mom's my okay. mom's the polish and ukrainian when my dad's jamaican. Uh, uh, oh right, right right and your dad's uh, got the jamaican roots oh lovely yeah. and so what did your parents do i remember i, I think you, I, I remember when when you were caught up in paris you, you didn't mention your mom was in real estate now but was that at the time what she was doing back then when you were a kid with your sister no back then she was uh she was a young mom working uh jobs at the 
department stores and that kind of thing. And my dad had a few jobs he was holding down as well to pay the bills. So it was a really standard kind of, you know, up, uh, getting to the middle class uh, kind of upbringing with my parents putting everything into me and my sister's education, which ended up where we went to a, Fr a French school. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. So free languages, so, yeah, it really makes you <laughs> sharp as a tack. So it's interesting to see that you've been in several iterations of, of bands and uh, throughout your career. So initially as part of like a band member um, in, in the, um, the first, one of the first iterations called me, uh, mom and uh, Morgan Taller. I'll help you Morgan out with Taller. that. <laughs> it's, it's, this apparently um, uh, guy who is the doctor who was, who was, uh, uh, pro-abortion rights I understand that's right yes he was a yeah. huge figure in Canadian uh in, in Canadian civil civil rights history you could say uh, for women's rights and abortion rights yeah okay 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 very topical at the moment for the for North America and so um so it's interesting to see that it's branded as third wave Canadian third wave ska, and then I listened to some of your tracks, and then I understood what that meant. This, this reference to ska thing, and uh, uh, during your time as, as uh, me, mom, and Morgan Taylor, and so at, at the time and still now. So of course you were uh, a uh, guitarist uh, as a performer. You were also a, um, uh, a singer, obviously, but. Um, during all these various iterations, uh, were you also a lyricist and a composer or um, at the beginning you were mostly a performer and then step by step you added the uh, ly lyric lyricist uh, skills and, and, uh, and uh, music composition skills to your, to your skill set or... Yeah, so when I started off in Me, Mom, and Morgan Taller, that was a group of friends in college that uh, that we decided to participate in a in the in the school talent end year talent show. Oh. And we we were also putting the show together, so we kind of had a little bit of uh, leverage to get, to get ourselves on the bill. It ended up being a huge success, yeah. um, chaotic, chaotic success with how, our how fellow did you students. The, uh, how long did you the, uh, the Wikipedia page uh, right there? Yeah. <laughs> that's it exactly um so i've been writing songs since i was a little kid it started with poetry when i was really small and um and uh in me mom and morgan taller i started to write songs um i was initially asked to join the band because uh the guys in the band wanted to do some specific ska covers that were sung by that were female uh fronted so uh so i said oh, okay sure i'll be a part of this and as the band developed and became a huge cult uh a cult band in montreal i was writing for the band as well I, i'd say i was probably like the third ranked songwriter in terms of number of songs i was writing within the band okay. so yeah. So, uh, I mean, it was really sh shortly after we started becoming pretty successful locally that I started writing as well. And in, were you in the band. at that time already? No, I, in Me, Mom and Morgenthaler, I was, as a, in Me, Mom and Morgenthaler, I was a singer, but uh, in order to write my songs, my main instrument uh, was guitar. I'd studied piano for a couple of years as a kid, so I had basic solfege and music theory. And then um, when I was 16, I uh, got a guitar, and that, that was just about three years before, two years before me, Mom, and Morgan Toller started. So I would bang out the songs on guitar and then bring them into the band. And But otherwise, my role in the band was as a singer. Awesome, awesome. And... Um... Okay, and then you evolved. So after a few years, you moved on to your own um, iteration, so through Mud Girl. So that's interesting as well what you're saying about w where the, the, this is coming from. I mean, I don't know whether you are saying it, but on Wikipedia it says that it's coming from a short story for, ch for children that you wrote. Do you want to give us the lowdown on the Mud Girl story? Sure. So I was... Um... I was living in Vancouver at the time. This is after I left my mom in Morgan Toy. I moved out to Vancouver and I came up with this character. There's a lot of rain in Vancouver. That wouldn't be anything new to anyone that's been out there. Um, 
but uh, yeah, it's a bit of a rainy, a bit more of a rainy climate. Uh, and I thought of this character who was a invisible uh, only, and was visible only to children and, and little animals. And she was an urban creature and um, made of mud. So oh. she could be created out of rain and wet dirt and, and, and uh, sort of an allegory, it's, I guess, from mother nature, but in a little girl format and uh, lives, lives in urban environments like park or mm-hmm. a parking lot, <laughs> so, you know, things like that. But, uh, and I, and so I wrote a couple of short stories about just adventures, her adventures, uh, in, 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 in urban environments and what happens to her. And when I was thinking, um, of putting out my own solo project after leaving me mom and Morgan taller, I just, I, I wanted a concept name. So I, I, I just came up, I thought, well, I'm going to call the project Bud girl and, and form the band, uh, within that concept. So it was really, I guess, a way for me to become a solo artist without putting my full name, Kim Bingham on it, but making it a, like a, a pseudonym in a way. Okay. And so, uh, also, probably it was probably a uh, sort of a le- like uh, a metaphor because you were so a, 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 a young girl, uh, not lost, but you know, living, fending for herself in a big city. I think Vancouver is quite big compared to Montreal. She's probably more, much more. It's got much more of a family feel. So it probably was also a stage of your of your life where you you knew how to become independent and autonomous. Um, okay, so I think your style also evolved from that scarfing, which you can definitely hear really quite well um, in uh, me, uh, Mom and Morgatala, into um, pro- solid rock, I would say, when you were in Mud Girl. And then I noticed that when then you did your own release um, uh, quite later on, with the, in particular with the Up album, you, you went more into this poppy style. Uh, so would you agree with and also it's interesting because when you were doing this pretty rock hard rock uh, you know hard rock style in, in, in the Mud Girl um, uh, um, catalogue and repertoire even it, it, your voice was still almost angelic um, I mean it's, it, it wasn't a kind of you know <laughs> <laughs> or pretty low voice like Rita Mitsuko you know Caroline mm-hmm. from Rita Mitsuko she's got a low, low voice with an Adele she's got quite a low voice but no your voice is pretty more on the range it's, uh, it's, it's quite quite you know um, high pitched and, and, and delicate uh, even though all the uh, arrangements were much more rock and bass and boom 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 bass <laughs> would you agree with this with this um, this sort of um uh, evolution towards pop music and also the fact that you always made sure that your lyrics were more on the um, ethereal side of things. Yeah, well, I think that the trend, the the evolution from Mud Girl uh, through to the Up album, where I put it, I at that point with Up, uh, I was I'm putting out music under my own name. Um, I think up what Mud Girl was put out more was a ni- mid nineties, late nineties kind of thing, and so that was also part of the grunge area. There was more of that kind of crunch, distorted yes. sound that was going on at the time. Um, I think what I was writing was uh, in a reflection of that time too, uh, and I think with up there was and and my evolution from mud girl through mm-hmm. to up was uh there was a, a i did a lot of uh writing first of all there was a quite a number of years between the two yeah. releases um i did a lot of writing collaborations a lot of uh yeah. a, a lot of songs that uh, other artists covered as well yeah, exploring you know, different creative avenues. So well, I'm up or in between? In between, yeah. yeah I'm going to come back to this. Yeah. yeah. So so I think but uh you know so I think that um uh definitely there was there was a, a, another level of um I, I could say that my creative skills had evolved at that point and and so as an artist, you know, I, I just am in, in a different place at the point where I'm putting out up than I was Fair at, at Medco. Fair enough. And also what I've noticed is the uh, the level of care and also creativity you put into into the videos, the music videos, especially for the up 
um, album. It's, have you always had quite a big creative input as a creator, as, sorry, as a director and as a producer of these music videos, or do you usually subcontract that to someone else? Uh, so usually when I started off in Mud Girl, I think the f my very first independent video after leaving me Mom and Morgan Taller was for a song called This Day off the Mud Girl EP. And that was my, my, con that was my concept. I was, I always had this, I've always had this video view and this yeah. is a very MTV yes. video, video kill the radio star, you know, MTV video, it's gotta be quirky, entertaining. It's a video. Why not? If it's a crazy idea, why yeah, not? That's yeah. what, you know, that's, that's, that's my point of view. And I think that sometimes a, a really strong, simple concept is all you need. Um, so, uh, contact music video was quite complex. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that was. Yeah. So sometimes the vision where I haven't had a very strong vision, mm -hmm. um, you know, the creative collaborator I'm with, the director uh, would, and then we'd go through, go through with that. Of course, I always have uh, final approval on whatever, whatever's put out. Uh, Contact was definitely one where um, the director took the lead on, on, on the ideas for that. And I think that she did a great job. Yeah. Um, for, yeah. For, but for a lot of them, um, you know, I, I produce them. So, uh, so like I said, either I'm coming up with the idea and we're collaborating me and the director on getting it out or else it's that the director's got something fantastic and, and, you know, and I'm just giving my final approval on it. Okay. Okay. Lovely. So, yeah. And so uh, actually, um, I think this is really relevant to basically the, the level of control you would have over the music videos, but were you signed to any label at this stage during the Mud Girl years or? I wasn't signed to any label. I had labels that were interested um, in Canada and in the US at that time around okay. Mud Girl. I did sign with EMI Music Publishing at the time it was EMI Music Publishing, now it's oh, Sony funny. ATV. Yeah, so uh, out of Canada, the Canadian office signed me for the world. Okay. So I was with uh, I was with publishing, but I didn't I, I hadn't signed with any. You I didn't have a label for no time. Okay. No, because yeah, usually it's the label. I mean, especially back in the MTV years, who would look after the uh, the music video creation. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, and um, so yeah, so after the Mud Girl years, I understand that you moved on to uh, a, a, another band, which in which you were basically the leader, the Kim Band, um, for quite a few years, actually around five six years. And uh, you uh, you were very very close to one of the band members, is my understanding. <laughs> you, did, did you not meet your husband in this band? Yeah, that was during the Mud Girl period. That I, okay. I yeah, and it was really just around the time that I released. Um, we worked on the Mud Girl EP together. Uh, my yeah, and uh, that's Stephen Drake, my ex husband, and I. And I was in a fantastic band called The Odds, one of the best bands ever and one of the best bands out of canada period but that's a whole other <laughs> so they're called the, the odds or odds odds uh, great 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 songwriters Are and going uh, I think so. Yes, I, I know that he he'd left the band a while ago, but the band is uh, the band is still is still is, working. To be honest, um, aside from um, arcade fire, arcade fire, mm -hmm. and um, you know the French Quebecois uh, people, <laughs> yeah, like Le Forestier. Or I think it's his, it's his name. I am not very familiar with Canadian music. Of course, there's also the new band with Avril Lavigne and uh, Drake and uh, and 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 yeah. Uh, but but of, otherwise. Uh, in terms of Canadian rock bands, aside from Arcade Fire, I'm a little. Uh, <laughs> There's a whole. Oh well, then you oh, should. Now you know. should. Yeah, well, one day you can take a deep dive and and <laughs> and discover all the wonderful music uh, out there that that's that's on offer. Yeah, but yeah. So so I worked with so I worked with Stephen on the Mud Girl record, and he okay. and he worked on the Kim Band record, and it was right around the time that the Kim Band record got released that um, we split up. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so really for the Kim Band era, um, I was uh, creatively yeah. at that point. Yeah. I was creatively on my own. Yeah. Okay. And so 
I, I noticed that you did quite a few collaborations. Mm -hmm. um, one of them with David Husher, who uh, I'm, I um, had not heard of, who seems to be um, an Asian uh, slash uh, European uh, um, mixed, probably Canadian man. Very handsome, really like the eyes and stuff. And so, actually, I watched the uh, MTV music video of his uh, of the title "Black Black Heart," in which I believe you you were um, handling the uh, female vocals. Did you uh, did you write as well? In this, uh, I didn't write. No. So that that's kind of an interesting uh, experience. Uh, first of all, David's fantastic, and I was really honored to be able to play with him for. Oh gosh, it was like it was a Good, good while. It was like two, three years. I think we played. I played in his band, and okay. um, well, yeah. Titles than Black Black Heart. Oh well, I was on the road. I don't know that I participated to on the recording sessions, the albums, but I definitely was part of the uh, touring, huh? and uh, yeah, I was touring band, and um, this was kind of around. So a while back, we're like around 2000, 2001, 2002. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, uh, well, with Black Heart, Black Black Heart, the interesting thing was that I didn't sign, I didn't sing that opera part. Obviously on the album, it's a sample. Yep. Uh, wow. and, yeah. And then live, uh, I would sing it. I would sing right. the, uh, the, the opera so part the live. the video with the girl, the girl with the brown hair, but short hair, that's not you, is it? No, it's uh, not. I was, and I was like, it could be her, but then the hair a bit too short. And yeah, and no, <laughs> no. But people, people associate my time with uh, playing in David Usher's band with singing the singing uh, the opera part of Black Black Heart. So I was wondering, I was wondering, yeah. oh, it's completely different uh, sort of music uh, register, but why not? Oh, thanks for clarifying this. And so, um, and so with with Nelly Furtado, who is obviously much more of a pop artist. So you you were a, a, a guitarist and backing vocalist with her on the road. Is that is that correct? That's right. Yeah, it was the same job I was doing uh, with David as a session player, which is a right. job I absolutely love. I love right. um, kind of getting into another artist's world and and being a part of of what they do and 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 kind of tagging along on their journey. And uh, so, in the same way that uh, David uh, and his people came and approached me to be a part of his band, uh, Nelly and her people had approached me. Well, I was on with David if I wanted to come and join up with her. And so I was honored to do so. And it was a really great experience. So where did you play, for example, with Furtado? So with Nelly, I, I did uh, an extended promo tour. So that was all radio and television all over the world. Um, I don't know. We didn't make it out to Asia. I didn't go to Asia with her, but uh, yeah, all over North America and all over Europe, a lot of uh, whether it's television shows or, you know, I mean, it was at the time it was like Tonight Show and Good Morning America and Ra Ra Rayuno. Rayuno. I, yeah, I loved it. I really did. Um, I learned a lot from her. Um, it's a lot of the time, you know, on these promo tours, uh, it's not the full band, so it's uh, as often it's not the full band. It can be just her and an accompanying musician at a radio station doing an acoustic, uh, the song, an acoustic version live. So a, a lot of the time I was the person there because uh, the musician there with her because I was playing guitar, yeah. uh, you know, acoustic guitar and or electric guitar, depending what the situation was and doing the backup vocals with her. So uh, I had quite a, I, I had a pretty much an up close and personal view of what the lifestyle is of an international pop star with a uh, song on the, uh, songs on the international charts. And I learned a lot from her about uh, uh, work because um, She's it's, a, it's a lot of work. It's, yeah, it's, sure. it's a lot of work. And I learned a lot from David as well. Um, uh, not to take anything away from David's success because he's a, a massively successful as well uh, as an artist. Uh, Nelly's success on the top 40 charts internationally, that kind of thing. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a big machine mm -hmm. and um, uh, I, I definitely appreciated her work ethic. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. yeah she, um... And her as a person. She's really nice. She's also Canadian. 
I, she I, is. And her middle name is Kim. So uh-huh. we, had, we had a lot in common. It was cool. So w- when you say you were, you her and the people and David and, and these people approached you, so w- were you ever uh, with a manager or an agent or always you manage yourself or... So I had a really fun period of my life being managed by network management and uh, network is based out of uh, Vancouver. They're an internationally renowned management company. And this is right around the mud girl period. Um, uh, when I had a lot of label interest, especially from the United States, uh, at the time, Network was managing Sarah McLaughlin, a Canadian artist who made it internationally. Uh, she also created a music festival called Lilith Fair. That was a women-led music festival, and I was uh, invited to be a part of that. Uh, Network manages, I don't know if they still do, but they have managed Coldplay, Avril Lavigne, mm-hmm. um, you know, some really major artists. So, hey, uh, Coldplay's yeah. Canadian? No, Coldplay's British, but they were managed by, they have been managed by network management. Um, I don't know who they're with now, but I do know that that, that Coldplay at one point was part of their roster. So, Probably somewhere uh, in LA, because I think like Chris Martin now is relocated to LA. We're living okay. with um, Dakota Johnson. Actually. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, that was, it was, uh, that was the one, that was my major stint with, uh, with management was at that time. And since then, um, I've had, some management interest here and there or they've been there for a few months and then they're not there anymore um i'm used to being a self an entre very entrepreneurial independent artist the bit that i i learned about you is that you also scored some uh, um film series and um and so you had a sync through bellamy i understand so bellamy was synced it to the um sorry <laughs> into the um into a tv show called uh i think good trouble thank you good trouble yeah but you also had um basically basically were commissioned a a film score for the uh, the series the tv series les invincibles yes that was another thing i was really fortunate um yeah, to be i was yeah i was fortunate to be asked to to score the music for the series that that story is kind of interesting because the it, it was really at the time um i was i was touring with david usher and i remember it was at a it was sound check at a show that we had in montreal that uh, this young guy, baseball cap and jeans comes up to me and says, uh, I'm a director and I'm a writer and I'm writing a TV series. And, uh, when I get the money to produce it, I want you to write the music for it. And it's about four guys and would love to have a female voice on the music as a counterpoint. And I'm a big fan and, uh, love wow. love for you to do it and i said sure keep, let's keep in touch and about a year and a half later he contacted me saying yeah okay we have the funding from the network and uh we're we're doing the first season and uh are you still available and so that's how i got into composing the music for les invincibles on which, mm-hmm. on which broadcast was it it, it was originally in canada uh it's a it was a quebec based show uh, in French, uh, yeah. So it was on Radio Canada, which is the French version of the CBC. Um, and then it ran for three seasons, and it was a cult hit. In fact, it still runs in syndication. It's still talked about in certain parts. It's 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 uh, the characters became iconic. Uh, the actors have gone on to do really great things. Uh, the creators of the show as well have done other series and been very successful since um, that show. Uh, that was script. 2005 to 2009, yeah? Yeah, it was, yeah, in that window also, um, the scripts were sold to a Franco-Belgian production company. And so I asked the Franco-Belgian production if they were interested in having me compose the music for that series as well. And they said, sure. So that series, the franco a Franco-Belgian production, mm-hmm. it was Franco-Belgian-German production, uh, that that uh, was broadcast on Arte, uh, and it ran for two seasons, um, and I did the music for that as well. In the mid-noughties as well? Yeah. 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 Awesome. Gosh. And did you pursue further this, this, this career as a, 
you know, in, in film, film. Well, yeah, that's, that's kind of the puzzling part to me is, is that part because, um, I've had success with sync. I've had success as a composer. I mean, the, uh, the Avacible, um, project in Quebec got me nominated twice for best original score, uh, from a disc from, sorry, from, um, from the uh, Prigemo, uh, the Gemini awards, which is the Canadian Emmy awards, you know, Canadian television awards. And, uh, I won for best theme song as well. Uh, I won an, uh, Canadian Emmy and Gémeaux for, for, for that. Uh, but following that, I couldn't get any representation and I didn't get any other offers for other projects. I, and so subsequently I ended up leaving Quebec to go to Los Angeles, mm -hmm. um, just because I could, and it was a change of scene and I wanted to see what, it, what was out there for me. Uh, in California, so your mom, your mom lives in Los Angeles, does she not? No, my I have cause I have family on my uh, my dad's uh, dad's side of the family that lives in in California, but okay. my mom's in Texas actually. Oh, sorry, Texas, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, you, you I mean there are indeed some of the biggest agents um, for music composition in Los Angeles, just Gerfain Schwartz, I think. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look, for example, at the French market, you, you, you see that there's just like a handful of music composers right. who are represented by uh, top a agents, such as Alexandre Desplat. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's another one called Neverny or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so, so, but it's quite rare to have a performer, um, songwriter who actually manages to get some uh, music composition work so well done. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, I know that. I know that uh, since I did that show, um, I, I mean, I think I was part of a starting of a trend of that kind yeah. of music in film and TV, which was more kind of singer songwriter based. The, pal the palette I used to write the music was the palette that I had available to me that I felt comfortable with, and that was a guitar based palette, vocal, uh, -huh. uh, percussion, that kind of thing. So, um, but yeah, I know that, uh, you know, it's, it's become kind of commonplace to hear more of that kind of music, but it, it wasn't at the time when I did it, 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 it was not. Did you record in a studio or did you do everything on Pro Tools or something? <laughs> Here at home on Pro Tools. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it was, I, I spent, I mean, you have to understand also, I spent a lot of my career, um, through Mud Girl and the Kim Band in the studio uh, was with my husband at the time, Stephen, and he was one of the top, uh, considered one of the top producers and mixers in Canada. So okay. a lot, I, you, know, you know, I was accompanying him on a lot of these projects. And, um, and I just, I also have a bit of a, I, I consider myself to have an ear uh, for sound. I like tinkering on gadgets. So engineering yeah. and that kind of thing. You do? Uh, I do. I do like that. Yeah. If you give me a, a gadget and a manual, I'll read the manual. I will. I'll read the whole thing top, top to bottom. That's the kind of person that I am. So, um, it, I, I was really comfortable. I've been always been really comfortable recording at home. You too. I will also do the empirical just, uh, with, uh, you know, using the gadget. So I'll do sure. reading as well as using the empirical method with the gadget, but also on this point of music composition for TV series, this is an enormous, I mean, although I know the streamers are a bit suffering at the moment, yeah, because of the uh, sort of economy slowing down and stuff. So people, I don't know why, people can't afford to have like three or four subscriptions per month to Disney Plus and Netflix and Paramount. This is amazing. I mean, uh, anyway, uh, my point is that despite this thing, um, it's true that there are lots of uh, uh, new TV series coming out, series coming out, and therefore um, it's probably yeah quite good for you know music uh, supervisors and uh, composers. If you like this episode of Lawfully Creative with Kim Bingham, why not listen to episode 17 of a show with French flautist, composer, and performer Magic Malik? Lawfully Creative is brought to you by Crefovi. Of you, you, so you've been in quite a few bands, um, either where you were fronting or when you were, uh, as you were saying, a session music, musician or a performer. 
what did you make of his band dynamics? Did you did you like being the leader in in these various bands for the Kim uh, band or or uh, Mud Girl, or did you prefer to be um, in a position where you were sort of an employee, or 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 you like to mix the both of, uh, a little bit of the two, or do you prefer the way music is done now, where you basically can do everything on Pro Tools? <laughs> Well, so I think that uh, for doing everything on Pro Tools and doing everything on your own that way, I think is a separate subject. But to answer your question, as far as like what kind of, uh, whether I liked being a session musician or being an independent uh, band leader, um, I, actually, I think I, I really loved mixing it up and doing both. That was definitely the most fun. The challenge is that once you're, when you're a session musician you're and you're dedicated to another artist project, yours definitely does take a back seat. So, uh, you know, deadlines, um, things that you might want to do, or I'll speak for myself, things that I wanted to do as an independent artist, I had to shelve or, or, time later on down the line because we'd be on the road for yeah. two months three months six months whatever it was so um but but i loved um that would be a bit frustrating though it, it was a bit frustrating and that's primarily why i decided that i would go back to focusing on my own individual career because i did have uh i did have projects that i wanted to take care of i mean it really was pretty soon after I uh, decided uh, after I, I wasn't working with Nelly anymore. I, I left Nelly's uh, uh, group that uh, Les Avasibas came along, and so I and I didn't even have that much time <laughs> to uh, between leaving Nelly's band and starting Les Avasibas to really work on my own album uh, project either. So yeah, so you know you you have to you really can only do one thing well well. Uh, at a time, although I know artists like I mean I'm guilty of that. I try to do multiple multiple things at a time, but it's just the reality of it. What I loved about doing I both have to pay the bills. So yeah, also, but what I what I loved about doing both was um, uh, just how you can learn from one situation and then apply right. these things you know to your own. Um, I really loved uh, as far as uh, working on my own. Mm -hmm. um, I loved also having the contracts, writing music for TV or uh, you yeah. know, ads and things like that, because uh, you are at home on your own and you're kind of like the queen of your own domain. And, and uh, you know, you've got your deadlines, but you're, you know, they're leaving you the space to work and, and, nice. and it's very well remunerated. I mean, exactly. at least my contacts, <laughs> my contracts were very well remunerated. It generates some additional streams of income, which, you know, in, uh, in this day and age is always very important. Yeah. The, the, the bit about Pro Tools and being able to do all your music on your own was that now it's amazing because you don't need to go into a recording studio with like, I don't know how many session musicians to do anything. You know, you can do everything on your own, but it's just when you go live, because I don't know if you remember that we, I actually um, discovered, um, not discovered, but I, I saw you playing at Midem in 2013, which probably was the second time I was going to meet them ever. I found in my phone in 2012 and so that's where I saw you and I suppose that you know for example at Medem you just had these session musicians for the live session were there but these are guys that you just going to see specifically for this uh, live Medem event and then everybody would move on to their you know to their other projects so I think this is quite convenient now because you just have basically to have to give a the, 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 you know the score sheet to your to your various session musicians okay so i've created this and you're going to play that and then we're going to do a live show and and then everybody was you know um go their own way so that's it seems to me that nowadays um compared to the grand jury out compared to the early noughties it's much easier to basically do all the groundwork do all the creation to the creativity by yourself so to speak and then after if you want to do some live performances yeah you hire some staff but they are uh, freelance so it's also cheaper and easy to manage have you have you noticed this uh, flexibility nowadays compared to how it was 10 or 20 years ago or Am I affabulating? <laughs> well, I think I've always worked that way since I left oh, okay. my, yeah, since I left my band, I'd say Mud Girl was, had the, it was sort of, was constituted as a band, although it was really me 
under a different, under another name, but, okay. uh, but other than that, yeah, uh, it's really since I, I, uh, I went under Kim Bingham, I dropped mud girl and I was the Kim band and then going to Kim Bingham. Um, I have been working that way with musicians that I've hired. In fact, I had a, at a certain point where, um, at a group of musicians I worked with in LA, a group of musicians I worked with in Montreal, a group of musicians I worked with in Toronto, a group of musicians I worked with in Europe and that kind of thing. And uh, so, uh, yes, it is convenient. I think uh, the thing I would say is it depends on the artist. Even if you have all of the, if you've got the material down and you can transmit it to the musicians to play it, you have to be a pretty astute musical director to be able to, um, draw out of the band of out of that disparate group of musicians sometimes um you know what the sound is that you're looking for so make sure it's a good fit yeah not all artists necessarily have that skill um it's an interpersonal skill it's also that you are looking you know what it is that you want to hear and being able to communicate that to the musicians i think if you you know and then it's the casting of the band too and who you choose to play that to play together that it's all compatible too so there's a few moving pieces to it actually sounding like a credible cohesive thing that delivers and i think that that sometimes it might be what's lost um in working that way uh Mm. when it's not successful right so this is something you have to take i mean to, to to be mindful of if you want to come across as a as a band um when you play live fair enough and so today, do you, um, are you still, uh, is your publishing still um, uh, managed by um, uh, EMI Sony or do you do that yourself now? Or I'm, I'm no longer with uh, Sony ATV. Part of my catalog is from the days of my girl in the Kim band. I asked to be let go during the financial crisis and they let me go for a dollar. So I was very happy about that. I mean, that was really wow. at a time when. Is your catalog back to you? Yeah, they didn't, they didn't, no, they didn't return the rights. They still have the rights on the Mud Girl and that's a co-publishing deal. So also um, the uh, the advance or something. They, they just basically, they did, they decided they wouldn't take, they would let me go for any future, uh, future, future songs. Yeah. But what about the Elp album? Is that (coughs) some of it, excuse me, some of it. Yeah. Um, Thanks. Some of it I'd written uh, while I was still under contract with yeah, with EMI at the time. Then it changed. I think it was at Sony. Sony at that point. Okay. And uh, so I'd say about a quarter or a third of the album is uh, with Sony Publishing, and then the rest of it is mine. Do you still see the residuals and the, the royalties and the royalty statement? Um, I mean, you, you started producing your own, I mean, doing your own stuff, you know. Um, so, yeah, that was in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. So uh, um, are you, how's that, is, is that something that you, you, you're still seeing some money coming through the, uh, the publishing and coming from the neighboring rights? Yes, I do. Yeah, I do. I mean, I I mean, it's, it's, uh, there's a few, there's a couple of things. First is my material isn't properly consolidated in all the streaming services. Uh, I found one issue questions. Yeah. Yeah. So that's actually something I'll be doing, um, in the near future, uh, which is to consolidate Kim band and and mud girl under Kim Bingham. So it's a re digital re-release so that, you know, if you go to my Spotify page, for example, or Apple music page, all the releases will be there because right now they're sort of split up. So my audiences are, are, are split up as well, but yeah, to answer your question, yes, I do. I do see. I still do see the residuals, but I expect that once everything's consolidated, it'll be even stronger that way. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah it's y- y- indeed that's true. You have to manage your catalog to, especially if you've been producing stuff um, under different names. Um, mm-hmm. That's a fair point. And, um, and so, yeah, so actually the question was, um, are you also seeing some min- money from the, the streaming as well? Um I do, but it's, I mean, it's a fraction of a fraction. I'm not at millions of streams. Um, you know, I think, uh, uh, I'm not at millions of streams, so I'm not seeing lots of revenue from that where I'm seeing revenue really is still from sync, uh, from if whether it's the composing contracts that I've had in the, and the, uh, 
uh, these series that are in syndication right. running over and over in these different networks. Residuals. Yeah, yeah. Or um, the song Bellamy that I sold to Disney for uh, the Disney oh. produced show Good awesome. Trouble. Yeah. Awesome. I wasn't aware of that. You need to add this to your Wikipedia. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I can't do it, but maybe I'll talk I'll talk to someone. Maybe they know ask someone and they can do it. I'll tell mom to do that too. Just, <laughs> And what about the live? I remember um, when we caught up in Paris around pre-pandemic times, two, three or four years ago, perhaps, you told me that you, you were going to Italy quite a lot because you were in a relationship with your hairdresser there. Who does yes, your well. good memory. Yeah, and, um, and so uh, on the back of that, I understand you've done a few shows there. So uh, are, you, are you resuming the live the touring live in Europe or is that... So I initially, you know, just, just as, um, I have budgets drawn up to do shows. I have all of that. And the pandemic really played wreaked havoc on all of it. I had a, the last show that I had booked was pre pandemic and it got, and it was at a festival in Italy and it got rained out so bad. So I haven't performed live, uh, since before, before the pandemic where I do perform live, I'm sorry, in person. Right, right. Uh, yeah, where I do perform live is online and doing live streams that I do do yeah. for my Patreon. Yes, I have a Patreon account and uh, for my Patreon subscribers, uh, I do a monthly love stream and uh, it's a really fun thing. We do it on Zoom. So we, you know, my subscribers and I get to catch up and I uh, I play requests Lunch. or my stuff reworked. Is it Kim, Kim Bingham, the handle? Yes, it's yeah, yeah, Patreon. Yeah, you'd find me under Kim Bingham. Absolutely. Okay. It's really fun. I it was one of those things actually it was during the pandemic. That's what I worked on was I want to get yeah. a Patreon out. I want to get performing at least in that way. And so yeah. it's been a little over a year that I've had it and I love it. It's so fun. Yeah, I think the uh, the podcast would definitely be a good addition, Kim, to your you know, like the mm -hmm. the word in addition mm -hmm. to all the uh, music like performances. Mm -hmm. You could also add that on the Patreon as cool. Um, cool. And so what prompted the move from, I suppose, LA to Paris? So it went from LA to Montreal to ah. Paris. I produced, it was yeah. really short. I was in LA for a, about a couple of years. I did the up album while I was there. I also, what else okay. I did, I did, yeah, I did the up album and I did an other, I did, uh, the soundtrack album for, Uh, I did a few albums. I did Antel Med, my French EP. I, I did a few things while I was there. Um, and I did the uh, the soundtrack album for Les Invisibles as well that I was there. It was my one uh, label, major label collaboration. It was a licensing deal with Warner Canada and that went very well. Um, so, yeah. I, uh, licensing deal with Warner Canada? Was with Warner that? Canada. for the uh, so I did a soundtrack album for Les Invisibles because the music okay. was such a hit with uh, the audience of the show Mm -hmm. They were requesting mm -hmm. uh, the cover versions and the music that I did. And so uh, awesome. for, to, for audience requests, I put together, uh, we, we put together a, a soundtrack album that I produced. Yeah. And so I did that out in L.A. I did up out in L.A. I did okay. um, 2010 to 2012. That's around 2000, 2000, uh, two, Up, I did after the soundtrack album. So that was around 2009, 2010. And I went back to Montreal to release it. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, that's where I ran into these issues with um, the album itself, uh, that there was a whole lot of high expectations for it. Um, but it was put out mainly in Quebec. And there, this, the feedback that I got was that it was a good sounding record. Uh, this is from radio. Uh, there in Quebec. It was a good sounding record, um, but American sounding and I was singing in English and they had a lot of French quotas. So um, I, that's when I headed out to meet them and uh, decided I would, I would join the Canadian delegation uh, and head out to meet them and see what happens. And that's where. Well, when, I, when, when I met you in 2013, you were not relocated permanently to Paris yet. No, I had just literally come out to see how things were going to go. And yeah, and meet them ended up being a big, Big hit for me. Um, I got oh, a right, lot of now. feedback. I know, I know. Yeah. It's too bad. It's too bad. I, I, I saw it coming, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not the French, the, the, the can, can mayor who is going to save me then. Now they say that the, the, the can 
town hall is going to take over. But I mean, these people don't have a skill set. So mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> like a, a, you know, like a, a trade show for for the music business. But no, I saw it coming. Me then, and it's. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but I mean, back in 2013, yeah, it was still cool and uh, and and quite a lot of. Uh, of great performances. Okay, so um, so in 2013, you were sort of testing the waters with coming to Europe, I understand. Um, and are you happy in, in Paris? I mean, is that working well for you? With all the new masks that we had to wear for like, <laughs> round the side. I mean, I barely stepped a foot in Paris for since 2019, to be honest. I go yeah. three or four times a year and I fuck off as soon as I can because I can't stand <laughs> this police environment well, how, do, how do you feel about it? Uh, about Paris in general? Yeah. Uh, Macron years, my God. Uh, you know what? Uh, Paris has been good to me, so I can't, I can't complain. Um, it, it turned out to be in a, in a really crazy way. I wouldn't have expected to be here uh, or based out of here because I'm between here and the United States. That's really how my well, lifestyle is. Uh, yeah, Texas. Yes. Here in Dallas mainly. Yeah. And, um, so that's, that's kind of been my lifestyle since I've been here. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's ended up being a good place, um, for me. So I'm, 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 How long is I'm, the flight Paris to Dallas? Oh gosh. It's like 10 hours, nine, yeah. 10 hours. That's long. So, so I remember last time I caught up with you, you said you also started to do some stuff in uh, real estate yourself. And, and, um, so I, is that something you're still doing or you? So, yeah. So one of the detours that actually, um, the things, one of the things that Paris brought me to and detours that my life has taken, um, since, uh, being here is that. Uh, I fell into real estate on the international side with Americans uh, wanting to uh, purchase in France, purchase property in France. And so I've started a little a side career uh, in that as well. And so I consult uh, for Americans. I've been consulting for years for Americans you know wanting to purchase property. Yes. And, um, and so that's what's led me to um, my master's degree that I'm doing in wealth management mm-hmm. at Paris Dauphine. Yeah. It's out of the, it's an outgrowth of my expertise okay. in in the real estate uh, sector uh, in France that led me to be uh, accepted into this master's program. Wonderful. And that's that, and that's sort of turning back over, uh, developing something new back in music uh, in okay. a new way. Yeah, in the blockchain, um, the my master's thesis that I'm currently writing is on how NFTs uh, change the artist business model, the musicians business Steve, model. Steve Aoki is very much at the forefront of this. I heard, I, I, I learned, I mean, I listened to a a, um, a podcast he's done with a guy from Decode. Uh, and, and yeah, it seems to be very much on the forefront of all that, Steve Aoki. I don't really know of other, a lot of other artists. Who are, oh, perhaps a Snoop Dogg is doing quite a lot of things with NFTs. Um, do you? So, what's the name of your master, by the way, at Paris Dauphine? It's uh, it's Master de Formation Master de en Gestion de Patrimoine. So wealth, wealth management. It's quite wide. It's not only Bitcoin or real estate. It's actually everything. It's everything having to do with how you manage a euro. <laughs> That's it. That's pretty much it. Paris Dauphine is extremely, uh, is, is extremely um, uh, renowned. So it's great to have this on your CV. Yeah, and what, very what, happy. Is the, what is the plan with this? I mean, how do you intend to use all these, uh, all these skills? So uh, the, the uh, there's a few, there's, I was thinking about how I was going to employ the, this new knowledge and wealth management, um, to my life and actually really focus pretty much solely on music or the music industry and being involved in this thing. I realized also for myself that I get bored quite easily. And, uh, as a kid, I, had a list of a dozen things I wanted to be in my life, whether it was an astronaut or a painter or a scientist or an architect or a singer or a rock star. And, you you know, wanted to do all these things? Yeah, I did. Yeah. And, and, um, and I, that was like, I'll be a lawyer. That's, that's, that's a lawyer in my family. I, I, was like, I want to be a lawyer. That's so good. It's so 
So you knew and here you are. For me, it's it's kind of been a, pin, a ping pong ball kind of thing. And and being a rock musician and a rock singer and a singer songwriter is the thing that's come the most naturally to me out of anything I've done. And I think that's why I've had the success that I've had in my career. But um my brain likes to do, I like to do other things. So the wealth management degree in the sense, the, the training, the schooling was really interesting because it is so many different aspects of if it's taxation or law or, or a business, you know, financial analysis or, you know, I mean, stock market analysis, there's so many different aspects and what can you do with this? Well, my master's thesis is really the thing that's guiding me right now because I am writing it on how NFTs are changing the business model for artists. As I'm studying that, um, I am also volunteering myself for my own thesis uh to be a, a guinea pig uh and create nfts mm -hmm. and get out there yeah so that's the next thing i'm be doing over the next few weeks is cool. creating nfts and putting them out there and this is where the podcast actually comes up too because as i'm interviewing people for uh my research because a lot of it isn't a lot of the research isn't academic the, the whole space is so new. There aren't a lot of academic research papers that are written on it. It's That's more of what's, well, yeah, but yeah, but and basically anywhere. Bitcoin's existed since 2018. You know, um, it's really been crazy since 2017. Um, NFTs are but still European, new. Uh, by definition, very risk adverse. So when whenever we're going to do some courses about that, it's not going to be Europeans that are going to, to put them out. It's going to be probably, you know, people from uh, the uh, Silicon Valley <laughs> uh, and um, universities over there and, and probably New York. So, um, so yeah, that's great. So you're gathering lots of information for these, uh, for these interviews. But you could, yeah, you could definitely do a podcast by mixing all this and making it like a proper, you know, document yeah not exactly document, like, maybe even video stuff perhaps. series yeah so yeah so i have uh cool. i have an idea of where i'm going to be taking this i'm 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 looking for podcast producers right now because i have the list of people who some people have said they're willing to talk to me so i've got my wow. interviewees ready just like you you see so i'm going to be jumping into that awesome. and um yeah and so that that means NFTs, it means Kim Bingham, you know, Web 3, 3.0 coming up because I'll be doing, I have unreleased songs and now there'll be the NFTs, the podcast and That's all of that. So it's kind of going, I'm going into a whole new space and uh, with this evolution of my career. Myself because you were saying, you know, 3.0 and stuff, but I mean, in our law firm, uh, we are doing this at the moment. We're working with developers to also mm. start selling our products online. Um, and through subscription models, etc., it's fascinating. And you know, um, that's what we need to prepare for the next ten years. I mean, mm -hmm. things are a bit slow at the moment, anyway, because of one thing or another. So let's make the most of the time by upgrading all the websites and uh, and doing more work on the you know podcast and how to. One thing though that I find difficult for podcasts is how to monetize them. This is still something which is um, not quite clear how you monetize podcasts because we don't really want to have lots of ads, but okay well i guess this is it for me in terms well, of questions thank you annabelle this and, fun. yeah thank you uh, for your time and um i wish you the best for this uh, for this um uh master when when are you supposed to wrap it up uh presenting it in about two months so i have until the end of august to write it and I'm presenting it early september no september wow yeah he's crossed lovely <laughs> kim it's been wonderful my thanks to Kim Bingham. This episode was recorded at Crefervy Studios in London and produced by Crefervy. I am Annabelle Duberti. Lawfully Creative is brought to you by Crefervy. <laughs>